La radio du salon de la radio. La radio du salon de la radio. Avec broadcast associé, maxillaire, RCS Europe, Multicam System, Save Diffusion, Towercast et Visionnaire. Avec euh, Olivier Audou de la Lettre Pro, bonjour. Bonjour. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on va aborder Est-ce qu'on va faire un petit bilan justement de la RNT sur, euh, sur la session qui va débuter Eh bien, on va parler pendant deux heures de l'état de, de la RNT euh, en Europe et son développement avec les, les quelques, les nombreux pays qui, ont, euh, qui se sont lancés dans la RNT et qui, ont, et qui vont donc donner un statut du progrès de la RNT. Il y a bien sûr deux pays qui sont mis euh, particulièrement en avant. Euh, la Grande-Bretagne oui. qui est le pays euh, d'honneur euh, du salon cette année et aussi la France qui euh, a lancé depuis l'année dernière les appels à candidature dans, dans plusieurs régions. régions. Euh, trois nouvelles régions vont encore euh, venir. Donc on va avoir deux intervenants anglais, deux intervenants euh, euh, anglais et euh, on va aussi avoir euh, des intervenants euh, d'Allemagne, de, euh, de Suisse et d'autres de, pays d'Europe. Euh, Antoine Baduel interviendra dans la deuxième partie euh, du euh, de la deuxième partie de la session pour un pour un, un format questions-réponses avec plusieurs de ces pays. Et enfin, on aura la présence exceptionnelle du CSA qui euh, viendra parler euh, du, euh, du développement de la RNT en France. Merci beaucoup Olivier. Donc, euh, je pense que vous allez pouvoir euh, vous installer pour euh, les retardataires. Et puis, euh, et puis bah, très, très, bonne, euh, très bonne conférence et on se retrouve juste après. En direct de la grande halle de la Villette à Paris pendant trois jours. La radio du salon de la radio avec broadcast associé, maxillaire, RCS Europe, Multicam System, SAV Diffusion, Towercast et Visionnaire. Hi, hello everybody. So we are going to start this uh, session, uh, this World EAB session. We have been running this conference for uh, several years now uh, with the World EAB and uh, we are going to uh, present Uh, the uh, status of the DAB across uh, Europe with a large panel of speakers. And we are going to start uh, with a specific session with two speakers from the UK, uh, Jimmy Buckland from uh, Wireless uh, Group and Jonathan Arendt from uh, Jazz FM. So they are coming from the UK and are going to give uh, uh, their view of uh, the DAB uh, in the UK. Jimmy? Thank you. So I thought I would um, talk to you a little bit this morning about the investment case for DAB from the perspective of a UK radio broadcasting group. Um, and, and obviously, I, I guess in, in talking about the UK, I'm aware that the situation in the countries that each of you are from may be very different. Um, in terms of the number of digital radios in the market and, and the levels of listenership. But in fact, it wasn't so long ago that the situation in UK was very different to the situation we have today. Actually, if you rewind to 2008, the investment case for digital radio in the UK was in serious question. You had a major television broadcaster proposing to enter the market and then entirely axing its investment uh, before it even got off the ground. And really at that point, people were openly questioning, does digital radio have a future in the United Kingdom? Now, if we fast forward eight years, uh, last year saw the launch of uh, a new second, no second national multiplex in the United Kingdom. And when the opportunity came up for that multiplex to be launched. The three companies that, that bid and were successful to launch that multiplex, my company and, and Bauer Media and the transmission company Arkiva, knew that we had to provide a financially stable and credible plan. And alongside that financial stability um, came a very strong commitment to making sure that we provided unique content on digital radio. So the brands that you see there on the screen are all unique, they're all exclusive to digital radio, and they all broaden choice into an editorial segment that was previously underserved. In fact, since the launch of the um, 18 services that you see there, we've added a 19th uh, on, on DAB+. And indeed, the, the, the launch of services on DAB+, has been another great benefit of this network, which, which Jonathan will, will talk a little bit more about. Just some context on, on my company and why we saw the opportunity to invest in digital radio. 
we came from a position where we were the third uh, largest commercial radio group in the United Kingdom. And really, our opportunity to expand was severely limited by the availability of, of FM licenses. So what do you do when FM is full? What do you do when you want to grow your business? What do you do when you want to bring new formats to audiences and attract new advertising revenue? Well, the answer for us came in launching digital radio services. And the three services, which I'll tell you about shortly, which we launched, have all contributed to us adding incremental listenership, which has not cannibalized our existing audience on our national radio business, but has added new listeners uh, and broadened uh, the profile of our audience to attract a wider array of advertisers. And we see that growth continuing, and we would expect uh, very good news uh, in, the, in the next ratings, which come out uh, next week. So the first service that we launched last year is Virgin Radio. Now, Virgin Radio has huge equity and uh, heritage in the UK radio market. It launched in 1994 and was a very large station with a very large audience and massive brand awareness. So when we brought it back in 2016, we knew that we would have to reinvent the brand, be true to its history, but provide a contemporary sound. And that's what we did with the, the fantastic talent that we were able to recruit, including the likes of Edith Bowman, who was a top uh, presenter from BBC Radio One, um, and some fresh talent, as well as some, some, uh, a good mix of experience. Now, um, as I say, it's a, it's a band with huge equity, so that we knew in launching it that we would have to we couldn't just launch with a, a, a small noise. We had to make a big noise in the market. So if I can just, uh, thank you, Olivier. I'd just like to share with you a video uh, which, which uh, outlines how we approach the launch of Virgin Radio. Um, and we thought, well, what better way than to launch with the first broadcast from a moving train? As we travel from Manchester to London in a radio first. It's a bit too real now that yeah. this is happening. We are on a train. It's moving. It's moving. You can hear us. We've got some amazing live music coming up for you. Who are those people? You know the people who sort of play their music too loudly on their headphones on trains? <laughs> we've brought five bands with us. I mean, we are the worst people if you're on a train with us now because we've brought the whole British music scene with us. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome onto the train two of Travis. Travis. Half of Travis. Half of Travis. Half of Travis. Travis. Yeah. You haven't talked to people on trains, this is so nice. I know, yeah. I thought this was quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone very special who would like to say hello. Sir Richard Branson, Edith and Matt. Hi! Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Well, it's great that you've gotten in touch and, and we've got someone with us, actually, who you, who you might recognise his voice. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> what an exciting day. It's uh, great, great to have Virgin Radio back on the, on the airwaves. We've arrived at Euston Station. Hooray! 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 So an incredibly technically complex outside broadcast, but, but the sort of event that we knew would give the station a massive impact from day one uh, and get people talking about the return of Virgin Radio. Uh, the second new service that we launched uh, was an extension from our very successful uh, biggest brand, which is TalkSport. So the, the power of TalkSport is the engagement it has with football fans. Uh, but what that has always left us with is an audience of people interested in other sports uh, that we maybe weren't able to cover as extensively. And this is the great thing about DAB, because there is more choice, because there is more capacity, you can extend brands and, and diversify your program offering. And that's what we've done with TalkSport 2 that has a great mi mix of cricket, rugby, plus a little bit more football as well. Uh, the next station I want to share with you, and the third that we launched uh, last year, is Talk Radio. Talk Radio is news, current affairs, and entertainment um, with um, big personalities, uh, opinion, um, and a very entertaining style. Now, the speech radio in the United Kingdom is very dominated by the BBC, so our opportunity in growing our business through new services relied on us finding a new position and a new opportunity in the market. And I'd just very quickly like to give you an example of, of where this uh, has worked really well. 
So I'm going to play you a short clip which um, is one of our presenters who is allowed to have an opinion. She's, a, she's allowed to express her view, to be opinionated, but she has the expertise and the authority to, to back up her argument. And what you'll hear is her confronting a newly elected member of the British Parliament. Um, and, and what she's effectively doing is she's, she's referencing the fact that a lot of people who did not support Brexit want a second vote. And so this new MP has been elected uh, she is from the party that does not support Brexit, that wants a second vote. And so Julia is able to challenge her um, on this basis. The Can we hear MP that, Olivier? For Richmond Park, oh, here we go. Sarah Olney to the show. Uh, good morning, Sarah, and congratulations. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, very nice to speak to you. We, 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 uh, we've been billing you all morning. We finally got you on. My first question, <laughs> most, absolutely the most crucial question, when is the second by-election going to be held? The second by-election? Well, I mean, we don't really know whether voters really knew what they were voting for when they elected you, so shouldn't we have a second So it continues. I won't play you at all. You um, don't you? But the, the point is uh, that she's able to express herself in a way that a BBC station wouldn't. And actually mandate. what happens clear, clear is you hear the PR the person the pulling of, uh, this interviewee British off air and sure ending the interview that? live on air. And the national well, press that this this generated was very significant in the newspapers the next day. Now, on the back of our launch of, of new services, um, this wasn't in the plan. This wasn't something we knew was going to happen when, when we launched these stations last March. We've now become part of one of the world's biggest multinational media groups in News Corp. Um, and just to give you a flavor of what, what the driving reasons for that were, is that the CEO and the, of, of News Corp uh, internationally and in the UK, and, and some quotes here. And what you'll see is they, they saw that with the, with the rise of digital, actually audio is, is more and more relevant, and our diverse digital radio offering uh, was very attractive as part of a multi-platform proposition uh, for that company. So these are some of the brands that we work with. I think some of the exci exciting aspects of this new partnership as part of News Corp now is we can forge all sorts of very interesting multi-platform partnerships with some of these fantastic newspaper um, and other media brands. And really that's, that's the message I wanted to end with because with the Sound Digital National Multiplex investing in DAB in Britain, it was all about partnership and, and a common goal and working together so that we could each sort of meet our, our um, investment and growth objectives. In the same way, we're working with News Corp and actually in the same way we work with broadcasters all around the world. This is one in Australia. Uh, with our international business distributing Premier League radio um, in the sort of same spirit of partnership. And I think that's a really important theme you know, as we consider the growth of digital radio, not just in the United Kingdom, but, but in other markets as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jimmy. So you can see uh, also for the, for the French audience, so... Uh, Le groupe a pu lancer quatre stations nationales uh, grâce au DAB. Um, so we are welcoming uh, Jonathan Arendt, who is the CEO of uh, Jazz FM. Just after uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation, we'll have a short Q&A where we'll be able to uh, ask some questions to these two speakers. Thank you. Do you want to get my... So I'm going to... Uh I'm going to talk about where Jazz FM sits, following on from what Jimmy's talked about. And, and in the same way that um, Virgin was a um, big brand in the UK, Jazz FM had a big existence bef before it became a 100% digital station. Um, we are totally about our content. Um, and I normally stand up and talk about how brilliant our output is. I'm not going to do that today, because I'm going to talk about Dab Plus. Um, a slightly emotionally different thing. Um, so we, we, you know, we are a jazz, soul, and blues station, predominantly jazz, and we're national. Um, the history um, of Jazz FM is that we um, were an FM station, which is why we're called Jazz FM, although we're 100% digital. Um, and we were in London, we launched in London in 1990, um, and um, in the Northwest in um, 1994, and that gave us about 30% coverage of the UK. We went on to DAB at the earliest opportunity in London um, in 2000, which was within 12 months of uh, DAB starting commercially in the UK. 
Um, and then we added a year later five more regions to try to increase our coverage of the UK. The business was then sold in 2002 to the Guardian Media Group. Um, and um, it was sold for a lot of money, 45 million. That's about, in those days, about 70 million euro, a little bit less nowadays. Um, and um, the, um, they, they bought it and eventually closed Jazz FM as a service down and relaunched another service. Um, and at that point, we became um, um, non-existent. And a few years later, um, uh, we relaunched, having licensed the brand back from Guardian Media Group. Um, and it launches digital only um, on the original DAB regionals that it was on, and then on national DAB in 2011. And that ran through to 2013, very expensive to do so. Um, and then we pulled back to um, DAB uh, just in London, um, uh, in the beginning of 2014. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of that is you can see that this was in transmission terms. We were there, not there, here, there, gone, back. Very, very confusing for listeners. But the one thing that was retained was the strength of our brand, um, and there was a warmth towards it. Um, and um, when we came back, we decided to stay as Jazz FM, not change the name, although we're not on FM. We went on national DAB in February 2016 as part of what Jimmy was describing. And it's really, um, for us, formed the next stage of what we can do with the, um, um, uh, the business. Um, I'll explain as I go through um, where, wh what our platforms are and how the share works between it. Um, it's, it's too early to judge what DAB Plus has done for us in audience term right now. Um, but. We are 100% digital and we're totally focused on being a quality stereo service. And the reason I stress this is that the move to dig digital for many people means that they buy as little uh, capacity as possible in order to be there. And we go, we need to be there, we need to be there in stereo. Um, uh, and when we start looking at the growth of what's going on in cars and DAB+, um, you, that, that experience is going to be fundamentally different to um, the experience of listening to uh, DAB on a mono speaker, which many radio receivers have been up till now. So for us, stereo um, or quality or high quality is absolutely the word that we're using all the way through in everything we do. And we're, on, we're, um, we're in stereo on DAB, DTV and online. Um, So our audience, 100% um, digital, we have, a, we have an audience of over half a million a week, and that cumes up to a million over a month and one and a half million over 13 weeks. Um, and in, actually in daily reach terms, which I know most of you use here, it's about 200,000 a day. Um, Sizable audience, uh, big audience for a niche music service, um, and we sit in a difficult place because we're big for niche and we're small for mass. And so there's a sort of uneasy place. So for us, it's about making sure that people love and understand what we do and that we use the digital growth to actually continue to grow where we are. And the changes that are happening in the digital market mean that we, um, we will be able to increase both our reach and our listening hours as digital becomes more available. That's mainly through the growth of DAB Plus and in-car. Um, we, um, there are other digital-only stations that have achieved substantial audiences with, with wider music formats. Um, Kistory and Absolute 80s have got around about one and a half million listeners, and BBC Radio 6 with the uh, um, might of the BBC behind them have got about 2.3 million listeners. These are 100% digital, they're mainly driven by DAB, so one can create an absolutely solid audience on DAB alone. We're often asked about our age profile, so I thought I'd throw, th throw this in. We are younger than most people think. Um, nearly 70% of our audience is, un is under 54. We over-index amongst 15 to 24s. 
and that's partially music policy and partially that we don't, you know, we are, we're not a nostalgia station. We, we deal with the music as if it's all current, although we, are, we have a lot of catalogue involved. And that's why we have absolute accessibility. And the fact that we are um, available across all the digital platforms, I think, has helped that. We're seen as, as a now station rather than something from the past. Um, we're the third largest jazz radio station in the world. We're bigger than any jazz radio station in America. We have a stable, loyal audience. Um, and we have disproportionately strong audiences um, via radio port portals, via consumer electronics. When we look at our numbers through TuneIn or what's going on on Sonos, we have a big, big radio share there. Um, we also have a substantial amount of listening outside of the UK. Um, and that's, that's in, um, in competition with countries where they have their own jazz radio stations, as you do in France. Um, so where does that leave us today? Um, let, so I just want to linger on this for a moment. So um, DAB represents 61% of our listening, um, uh, uh, DTV 13%, and, and mobile internet 26%. Our mobile internet um, performance and our DTV performance are high. And that's why our 61% DAB, DAB is low compared to um, other services that do, that do the same, uh, have the same sort of mixture of us in transmission terms in the UK. And the average for the UK is more like 70% being on DAB, um, if you look at the same, same elements of comparison. Um, we expect our DAB percentage to marginally increase over time but we also expect our mobile internet to increase over time. And the, the squeeze will go on DTV, which in our case is mainly people who listen via Sky Television. And there's lots of people who are listening there when we were not available in any other way across the UK. And we have a very good inheritance, so we're not gonna lose it, but I think our growth's gonna come elsewhere. Um, and that's why for us, DAP Plus is a long-term game. And we are just at the beginning here of what's gonna go on over the next five or 10 years. So let me just talk about where we are, wh where digital listening is in the UK. Um, I, I've kept this um, in, in, in the original format that Digital Radio UK use because um, it shows a number of things. The first is that we're, digital listening is now at 45.5%. Um, and, it, it, and it's gonna move towards 50% this year and we think by the end of this year we'll be over 50%. And if you think about that as all digital listening, 70% of that is DAB. Um, the reason the 50% is important is that's the moment that the UK regulator and the government are going to start looking at what the, f what the future of FM is at the, in the UK. So that's a trigger point, and that's why the 50% is so important. And if you look in London, we're already way beyond that. Um, and so um, uh, London's been driven by much more availability, many more services, much bigger choice, and therefore is much higher. Um, the overall numbers here are really positive. And if we look at what's happened in 2016, um, very much driven by the launch of the second national multiplex, um, I've just picked up four numbers here. The first two, digital listening grew 9% last year. And digital reach, the number of different people who listen to um, listen of, of our digital, grew 6% and is now at 60%. So 60% of the UK population are listening on digital. Um, mainly driven by uh, the launch of, um, of, of Sound Digital, um, listening to national commercial stations grew by 25% last year. These are big, big numbers. And the final number is in-car listening ship which grew by 39%, is now under a quarter. And um, these, you know, that last point is fundamental to what's really, really pushing things forward in the UK. Um, I just want to recap on, on DAB+. Plus. Um, we don't use the word DAB+, Plus in any of our communications at all, with anybody. We talk about stereo, Jazz FM in stereo. And that's what comes up on the displays and all the radio, and we just fit in with the same list, whether we're, whether we're on DAB or DAB+, Plus, is an irrelevancy to our listeners. Um, and so we, we don't use this word. That said, 
A year ago, there weren't any DAB Plus stations in the UK. Um, and now they're over 40. There, there are four stations on, on the national multiplex. There's a few more stations on the old regional multiplex, plexes. Um, and uh, there's a number of new stations who've come in on small trial licenses. And this is growing incredibly fast. That is going to help dri drive listening. I want to end just talking about the car side of things. Um, as you can see, 87% um, of new cars in the UK have DAB in, um, as standard now. And that, in, that means over the last three years, um, most, car, most new cars have had DAB Plus in there. So, so although, although many people didn't realize that it was there, still don't know what it means, don't really care what it means, um, it's just there. It's there as a, as a station on the list. And it means that we've gone from um, really not having that many um, people be able to receive DAB Plus to about a third of DAB receivers in the UK already um, able to receive DAB Plus. Um, and the big mission now is how we're going to convert people who've got older cars and retrofit. But this is an amazing place to be and alone puts on nearly 2 million new vehicles on the road with DAB Plus installed as standard. It's an incredibly, incredibly positive place to be and it's driving growth. Back to Jazz FM. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. F following one question to, to start the Q&A, um, I know that so the second multiplex has been launched last year, and I think what was a big surprise was the listening figures from the first radar, uh, radar uh, measure, uh, measure, which is every quarter, right? And there were some good listening figures, and in particular for DAB plus stations, where uh, people were not too sure if people were well equipped at home. Can you can you comment on the first on the first radars from the from the from the stations from the second multiplex? Uh, I can I can talk about Jazz FM. Maybe you can talk about the others. Yeah. Um, person, I mean, I think the you know the results are good. It's positive, but as far as I'm concerned, much too early. So I think if one is if if one's putting a spin on it, good results, good results all round big changes in numbers, and if you look at the numbers that I was talking about in terms of people who are listening to the radio on, on DAB, it is actually the only, the only identifiable part of that equation. So, so yeah, really good results. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it takes people six months to a year to realize what's going on in their head and how they record it, and so I'm looking at this year as the year that I'm going to be able to really see how that bites for us and have a benchmark for what the next few years are going to be about. I completely agree, Jonathan. I think the other thing I would add is um, we've had the benefit of 16 years of experience in the UK in digital radio. And, and the key with the brands that you saw that launched on our second, second national multiplex last year is they're all brands that had some equity, that had some existing... Uh, analog listeners or existing brand profile on other platforms. So the strength of the cross promotion that underpinned those launches was very important. And I think if you look at a service like Magic Chilled, which launched on DAB Plus, Magic as an FM station in London, as a national DAB station, was then able to convert listeners to, to a further station on DAB Plus that was offering a more differentiated music proposition. And, and I, I'm sure that helped uh, deliver what was definitely a better than expected initial performance for, for DAB Plus. But let's see what this year has in store. Yep. Thank you. So we are going to take a few questions. We have quite a heavy program, so just a few uh, questions. I'm, I'm happy to take some qu questions in French, if necessary, as well. I will be happy to translate. One question in the back. Uh, <coughs> good morning. I'm not sure to have well understood if when a good station uh, broadcasts in DAB Plus, uh, is a, it's a simulcast with DAB? You, you, I mean, you... Or you, you, it's, you it, it's a pure DAB plus transmission. So Jonathan, in, I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, we're, so we're still on DAB in London, 
and we're on DAB plus across the whole country, but we actually put slightly different output out. So you, you which mean is, you which is mainly to do with the commercial content, uh, rather rather than any pure editorial content. So we run we run two outputs, but they're they they're. they're, they're they're pretty much simulcast with different commercials. Yeah, and what about the equipment of the households? I mean, are they equipped with DAB Plus receivers already, or it's well, just beginning? Well, it's about, uh, about a third of, of DAB receivers in the UK can receive DAB Plus. People don't know whether they can receive no. it or not. So, so you launch, they become aware of you, they retune. And if you appear, you appear. And if you don't appear, they either go back to what they were doing before, get in touch, and ask where they can where they could be heard. But no, we're, I mean, I think it's not a bad place to be with 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 a third, um, and um, putting on putting on millions through new cars, and hopefully the program of con of, of of conversion is going to continue is going to be great. All I, th I think nearly all. Um, um, digital radios in the UK have been able to receive DAB Plus for about two or three years before we launched any services. So there was a, there was, there was structure there before it happened. Thank you. Okay, if there is one more question, but it's going really to be the last one, very, very quick. Thank you, great presentation. Um, we're so lucky in the UK, we've got so much choice, it's fantastic. Um, and I don't think many people in the room, unless they've experienced this choice, can really appreciate just how great it is. I noticed nobody so far has mentioned quality, because uh, 15, 16 years ago, that's how they tried to sell DAB. It's about a better quality signal, and in many cases, of course, it wasn't. Um, but what is really moving DAB is this extension of choice. Um, I, I, the stations that you've mentioned, I love them, I listen to them a lot. Talk radio, I love a lot. But if I hear Julia Hartley Brewer uh, being um, incredibly uh, take his, take Brexit, his mic away. Brexit, Brexit -y, then then I have to say I'll switch over to LBC where James O'Brien is a Remainer. And so the serious point is the extension of choice, are you growing listening or are you just cannibalizing other stations and each other? I think that's, that's a very complex question um, that's difficult to, to answer with a really good grasp on you know, what individual listeners are doing. But actually, what, what it's most important in the UK market is that we're seeing growth in what advertisers are spending on radio. So in terms of, is radio growing in the UK? It is. It's going up year after year. Advertisers are spending more on radio. And that's because they see that the audience is very engaged. So you know, overall, you could say that there are about a billion hours of listening that happen a week in the UK, and that's fairly stable. Um, but actually, in terms of the overall perception of radio as an advertising medium, you know, that is at a really strong moment at the moment. And that's surely because of that, that extension in choice. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy and Jonathan. We have to, we have to uh, go next. Thank you very much for coming from uh, the UK, and you are going to remain here for the, for the rest of the session, I guess. So we are going to welcome uh, Jean-Marc Dubreuil uh, from the World DAB in, uh, in France, who is going to give an overview of uh, DAB Plus in Europe. And the rest of the world. Oui, bonjour. So I'm going to, uh, to do that in English. I uh, hope that will be okay for everyone, but uh, uh, you can ask questions anytime you want, French or English at the end. Um, so first, uh, the Word Dab. Where is the Word Dab? The Word Dab is the uh, Global Industry Forum for Digital Audio Broadcasting. So basically, that's a, a membership organization, and uh, we are promoting and developing Dab uh, throughout the world. Um, I really have two main topics today uh, to discuss. First one is the progress to date. Where are we? Um, some, some of uh, what we're going to discuss here uh, has been already uh, mentioned by Jimmy and Jonathan. It's going to be also mentioned uh, by the other uh, speakers uh, that are going to come in, uh, uh, in the next uh, part of this uh, session. And then we'll go through, uh, through lessons. Um, there were some comments about the content earlier and uh, the choice of content. Quality of sound is, uh, is critical, but we'll go through the lessons learned and the next steps, what the World Dab is doing in order to facilitate the transition to uh, digital audio broadcasting uh, throughout Europe and the rest of the world. 
to start with one, one number. Um, uh, that may be a surprise for some of you, but uh, today, if you are going throughout Europe, about 56% uh, of Europeans can receive a DAB or a DAB plus signal. Uh, that translates into uh, uh, another number, which is about 400 million people throughout the world uh, can uh, also receive a DAB or a DAB plus signal. So that's a significant number. And obviously, for our industry, for the radio industry, uh, something that we can uh, uh, definitely not ignore. So DAB is moving, and uh, uh, we said the title of the presentation is The Road to Success, but the success is really happening, and the trend is extremely, extremely positive uh, for, for the whole industry. Um, there is also one, uh, uh, one red bullet here, which is we are seeing the first country uh, to uh, uh, move 100% uh, to, uh, to digital. It's not exactly 100%, but uh, Jorn will uh, cover that for Norway uh, later on. But uh, Switzerland also is uh, considering uh, the uh, FM switch off. Uh, in 20, between 2020 and 2024. So uh, DAB has really taken uh, its place in the world. A lot of European people can uh, receive it today. A second number uh, that is also very interesting is the number of receivers uh, which have been sold already. Uh, it's 50 million uh, units, uh, 50 million receivers, uh, and they are available uh, from a price as low as 20 euro today. Uh, so we, we heard, and specifically in France, uh, a lot of comments that uh, uh, receivers are expensive, they are not available, it's difficult to acquire, it's difficult for the people who already have a radio at home. Actually, now you can find basically anything. The other thing that we are finding uh, is that uh, uh, people uh, tend to buy higher-end receivers and what they would buy if they were buying an FM receiver. Uh, it's, I, I define that, that it's the beginning of bringing the radio back in the center of the home. Uh, so that's very, very interesting to see that uh, with DAB, with the choices, what we're bringing uh, to the party. So the, uh, the listeners are actually buying new radios and um, making it, again, important in their home. So 50 million receivers uh, is a, a significant number. Uh, that's uh, home receivers. But the next place where you are listening to a uh, radio is obviously the car. So I saw that there is a slight uh, different number between uh, uh, Jonathan's presentation. He was saying 87% uh, of the cars in the UK uh, actually have now uh, digital audio broadcasting as standard in, uh, in the new cars. Uh, but we are basically talking about the same number. We, we have reached a threshold uh, in these countries, so UK, Norway, and Switzerland here, uh, between 65% uh, on one and 86% on the other. Um, just want to, uh, to warn you on the numbers. Some of the numbers you're going to see in the next few slides are talking about uh, standard, standard, and others are going to also include options uh, in the uh, uh, car uh, numbers. So they may be slightly different, but uh, they are all telling the same thing. Uh, the trend is extremely, extremely positive for uh, DAB uh, being installed in cars, uh, and obviously very important for car listening and the choice for the end user. I mentioned trend in cars, and that's exactly what we are seeing. The trend, uh, it's moving very, very rapidly to more and more new cars uh, uh, getting, uh, uh, and this is standard fit here, getting digital audio broadcasting uh, in a uh, 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 standard. You buy a new car, you go to a, a retailer, a reseller, and uh, this is what you can, you can find. 83% uh, to 86, 87, depends if you're looking at the last number or the uh, year number. Norway at 78%, uh, uh, Switzerland at 49%. Uh, MCDT is actually saying 65% uh, numbers that are not 100% comparable. Focusing on France here, we already have two numbers. This is standard fit. 15% of the new cars are actually coming uh, with DAB in France. And it's about 30% uh, of new cars that have either standard or options uh, for DAB. So the summary for that is from one year to the other, uh, you are seeing a very, very, very positive trend. Uh, for, uh, for new cars, standard fit, and obviously, uh, and we can discuss that uh, later, you have for existing car all the options possible, number of options to uh, uh, go and install DAB uh, into your car, yourself or the dealer, no question. Pause for a second here and uh, rewind uh, eight years. Uh, eight years ago, basically, we had three countries that we're uh, developing, uh, developed countries as we call them here, or established markets. Uh, they add uh, a DAB uh, as a uh, 
uh, a regular um, a radio broadcast. Uh, UK, uh, Denmark, Norway, and Switzerland. Uh, I say three, four. Um, and um, that, was, that was a picture of Europe uh, eight years ago. If we fast forward, this is a picture today. Uh, basically, most of the country in Europe are considering DAB, have implemented DAB, uh, or have trials going on, uh, are de deploying. So you see, uh, uh, obviously, uh, UK, Holland, Germany, Italy, Slovenia, uh, Norway, all, all having established services, 90% uh, plus coverage of the population, uh, you are seeing uh, countries uh, uh, following very, very fast behind, like France, uh, uh, Belgium, Poland, uh, that are uh, de deploying DAB uh, rapidly. And a number of uh, 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 countries in the center of Europe that are considering, uh, uh, that are doing tests uh, with, uh, with DAB. And we're very, very positive uh, that uh, DAB is uh, uh, moving uh, as the standard for the future of digital of broadcasting uh, in uh, in Europe, and two countries here are called out specifically: Norway and Switzerland. I mentioned it uh, uh, briefly earlier, but Norway has started to stop FM. Uh, that was uh, January 11, and uh, uh, so basically everything is going according to plan. Uh, not going to say that uh, everything is 100% under control. Jorn will cover that in details, uh, but this is extremely positive. Everything was prepared. Uh, we knew that uh, there would be some, uh, uh, some challenges to overcome, but they are being overcome, uh, and uh, it's moving smoothly. Everybody is watching what's happening in Norway because that becomes a reference of what needs to be done uh, for other countries. Uh, Switzerland is going to be a fast follower. Uh, the expectation is that between 2020 and 2024, uh, this is when you are going to, uh, uh, to see uh, uh, Switzerland deciding to switch off FM. And obviously, UK uh, is looking at um, uh, the numbers, the, the percentage of uh, digital listening, and this is when uh, uh, the regulator and the parliament are going to uh, consider if they can set a date uh, for FM switch off. So uh, fast-moving uh, environments, Europe is definitely uh, moving to uh, digital audio broadcasting. Uh, if I'm a, a listener, or if I'm a car manufacturer or receiver manufacturer, I look at that chart and basically, you know, we mentioned earlier, 60% of the population has a DAP signal, receives a DAP signal, the trend is positive, so I should go in that direction and uh, uh, obviously consider DAP as uh, one of the choice I have in front of me and the required choice uh, to uh, deploy uh, radio in my country. But it goes also far beyond Europe. And uh, we are seeing here a number of countries, be it in Africa, in Middle East, uh, uh, in Middle East or uh, in uh, Asia Pacific, considering or deploying uh, digital radio. So w one country is uh, uh, standing out here, and that's Australia. Uh, Australia is one of the poster child of what is to be done for digital audio broadcasting. Uh, they are covering some of the main cities uh, out there, uh, and they are really uh, they are the example of what needs to be done between all the stakeholders uh, to, to make sure the listener at the end, uh, our target audience, uh, knows that uh, DAB is happening, that they have new services, uh, better quality of sound, and so on. Um, there was one example that uh, uh, we, we'd like to take, which is what they have done with the, uh, uh, the, last, the smartphone, which has DAB integrated, certainly familiar with the LG uh, Stylus 2. Uh, so in Australia, what they did is that they, uh, uh, they named that uh, phone, uh, or at least they made sure that the uh, uh, listeners, the buyers, knew that that phone uh, embedded a DAB chipset in it. And they could listen to their preferred um, uh, radio station on that phone. And that's where uh, this phone is, uh, is a bestseller. Um, so there is definitely uh, uh, a, tr a trend which is extremely positive uh, for DAB in Europe, obviously, but also throughout the rest of the world. Uh, one country I want to mention, last one, is South Africa. South Africa uh, has a test ongoing, and they are already covering 20% of their population, uh, moving also very, very fast to digital audio broadcasting. So that's the status. Uh, very, very positive status. Uh, and obviously, we learned uh, about uh, uh, how to make it happen uh, in the different countries. Uh, the one thing that we learned is that DAB needs to be part of the strategy for radio in the future. 
uh, we can say, okay, you have FM analog on one end, uh, IP on the other, internet uh, on the other end, and you don't want to consider digital audio broadcasting. What we're finding in every country that has developed DAB is that with uh, the quality of sound, with the new services, you are gaining uh, new listeners. And that's very important. Uh, we, uh, uh, just before that session, we were discussing with the, uh, the French radio broadcasters. Uh, and um, we, uh, we were talking about some of the uh, uh, dedicated stations that are coming in France but are, uh, that are also available in other countries that are targeted at, targeted at specific populations. They are the ones that are the fastest growing ones because you answer uh, to a niche uh, and that niche uh, is actually sometimes much bigger than what you were expecting. But it's also a way to, to touch uh, populations that were not considering radio anymore. So it's a good way to, uh, to make radio uh, a core uh, of uh, uh, the people's life. The key to success what, that we have seen in every single country uh, is uh, that uh, uh, you need to have political commitments and, and a full industry collaboration. So all the stakeholders need to work together to make it happen. And of course, we, uh, we are not going to ignore that uh, there are some economic concerns and uh, uh, there are some economics to consider, and we're trying to address them also. Uh, one of the key elements, obviously, the FM spectrum is full, and I'm going to accelerate a little bit because I want to give some time to the other speakers. Um, so the FM spectrum is full, and one of the ideas is uh, obviously to uh, offer new services. Some of the FM services move to DAB, but you have also a number of uh, new services, and that was also mentioned by Jimmy and Jonathan just before. Uh, these new services bring greater listening, so very, very important also, because you are capturing new audience. And it also generates increased revenue or lower cost, lower cost for, uh, for some of the broadcaster. Cannot ignore that. That's just one example that uh, uh, we are giving for national radio services, specifically multiplied by three in some of the countries. So more choices again, uh, multiplied by three, but also with a much, much higher quality. Uh, I heard the comment earlier about the digital audio quality and sometimes the quality is not at the level, but that's also some, what most of the countries are doing and making sure that's happening. Digital quality, uh, that's the example for Italy here, is a key item uh, to make digital audio broadcasting happen. Uh, Jazz FM was also a key example on that one. Stereo and quality that you are finding again in your car uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, a key choice, uh, key element of choice for the listeners. Uh, last point on, uh, 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 on the benefits uh, or something that we cannot ignore uh, or forget. So you have more information coming with DAB, so enhanced traffic information as an example, plurality we discussed already, lower cost for the broadcasters. It's fully reliable in case of emergency. It's broadcast and we know that in some difficult time it's very important to have broadcast as a mean to touch your population and the spectrum use it, uh, is also very, very uh, efficient, much more efficient than we can, we can get in, uh, in FM. So basically the same business model as what we have for broadcast, but uh, brought to, to digital. Second point is the uh, political commitment and industry collaboration. Everywhere we have seen that uh, uh, content, coverage, uh, car manufacturers, consumer devices, communication, all needs to happen together. And that's also a discussion we just had before with the French community. Uh, we need to get communication going when we're going to cover Lille, Strasbourg and Lyon. Uh, very, very, very critical here. Uh, and we cannot forget the advantages of broadcast. Free to air, the cost for listeners and for the broadcasters. And there is no gatekeepers. No one is going to tell you how you're going to do your business. It's very, very important uh, that you are in control as a radio uh, industry of your future. And the last point that we cannot ignore uh, is economics. Yes, there are, there are some uh, uh, potential economic concerns. Simulcast we talk about, uh, the cost of uh, uh, the revenue that uh, it takes. It takes time. Uh, uh, again, Jimmy and Jonathan mentioned it, it takes time to get the, uh, uh, the listeners, the audience, uh, to get uh, uh, revenue uh, out of new uh, radio stations. Uh, and we are taking, we are working all together, uh, we are in this reform, we are working all together to make sure that we are taking measures. And the key example that uh, I want to give you is what's happening, I'm going to skip that. 
uh, in, at the European level. Uh, there is a lot of discussion at national levels uh, to make sure that uh, all the digital receivers uh, embed a, uh, a DAP chip uh, in the future. So initiatives are coming from different countries like Germany, Italy, the Netherlands uh, or the UK. In France we have a law which says that after 20% of coverage then every receiver needs to embed uh, a DAP chip. Uh, but uh, uh, this, this discussion which is happening at the national level uh, is also now happening at uh, the European level. The same way that happened for DVB in television, the same kind of discussion is happening for uh, 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 radio, radio receivers uh, at the European level. It's going to take a little bit of time, but uh, by 2018 we expect uh, that, uh, or we are asking that receivers uh, should integrate uh, FM and digital capabilities uh, uh, at the European level. Okay, so conclusion, and I'll leave the floor for the other speakers. DAB is a key part of the strategy for radio in the future. We know how to make it work. Uh, we know that it's going, uh, co going to work only through collaboration and uh, to help the economics. Uh, we're also taking some initiative for international receiver regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jean-Marc. We are going to welcome uh, Jorn Jensen from uh, NRK in, uh, in, the, uh, in Norway, so the first country to do its uh, digital uh, switchover. NRK is the public broadcaster in Norway. We start with a video, Jorn. We, we start with the video, and this, this video shows actually what we are doing for the moment. This is nitty-gritty work. We go out, talk to people, be prepared for the shut-off, and uh, we help them getting things done. This is our beautiful country, and we drive around in this van, and we have five teams who go around. There's a boat, boat antenna, because we have a lot of fishing, a fishing fleet up there. Yeah, well, <coughs> thank you for, yeah, yeah, it's, well, it start, started again, so <laughs> you can have the video if you like. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, I would like to tell you a little about the story on uh, how we got there, so you can get the Im impression on, on uh, what it takes to, uh, to make the plan. So, yeah, I'm Jörn Jensen and I work for the public broadcaster in Norway. Let's... Uh, Let's go back a little in time. We saw that uh, radio, first of all, radio is a very strong uh, and healthy medium. But we didn't know what is going to hap happen in the future. Let's go back to 1995. That's a young version of me standing on the left there. And you can see on the computer how far this is away in time. Uh, the first uh, digital radio station in the world, uh, DAB, called uh, a, a classical music station. And when we made this station, we, had, we know that there are no more FM frequencies. We know that we have a very old and costly FM network. So then we did a lot of work. We built out the coverage. We got more content. We started more radio stations. A lot of the European companies like Pure and, and Roberts and all those, they made the radios. The prices fell. Then we saw that not only Europe was moving, but Asia was also moving. Then we started thinking about maybe we can have a plan for the switch off. So it slowly grew. And then we got into all the official reports from the parliaments and the, the government stuff. And that ended up in 2011 where we had our shut off plan. But the government said you need five criteria to be able to shut off FM. Coverage for the public and, and commercials. You need to give the, the listeners more content, not only simulcast what you have on FM. You need to solve the car problem. And 
people need to use digital radio in any platforms, at least 50%. And we will check you in January 15. We did all the checking and it was approved. So people do want more content. This is actually a picture I have taken. It's my son. He's a shoe freak. He wants content. He wants more shoes. And we want more uh, audio stations. So if we look, go back again to 1993. This was NRK, our three radio stations. Uh, in the middle, the big program one that covered everybody. Uh, down uh, program two, which was a sort of cultural radio station, and up left we, we made the, the teenage, the young channel. But we asked ourselves, what do we need to create new content? What is happening in other countries? What is missing in our, in our market? And how can we be a better public service? And this is the content we have today. It's a, it's a well, very well-defined uh, uh, scheme where you can see uh, uh, very far up there are some jazz station, classical music. Uh, at the very bottom we got the weather channel, uh, we got the sport channel, we got the news channel and so on. But there are, we, we, uh, we found out that there were one out of five listeners is about 50, uh, sorry, about 60. So we had to create a special channel for them. And we took, uh, started off in the big program one, and we made program one plus for the elderly. And uh, this became a huge success. The two other radio stations, which is very successful because everybody speak about the young people uh, losing off uh, radio. But in Norway, we managed to make a radio super, which is for the, for the very children, uh, the MP3 channel, which is for teenagers, and the P1 Plus for the elderly one. And for the, in one week, P1 was, the, was the, the fifth biggest radio station in Norway. So content is what it's all about. So this is our, the national services you get in Norway today. Uh, before you you could you could have only only five national stations, but this is a very very good offer. So uh, the 15 uh, upper on the top that's the public, and the 15 on the bottom that's the commercial radio stations. If you drive into a tunnel, this is what you see. Uh, you have to find the frequency on FM. That was the old days. Today. No matter what you listen to, any of the 30 radio stations, the road authorities will break in and give you an alarm if something is wrong in the tunnel. So security is very important. And of course, we, we, I could talk for an hour about the cars and adapters. The new cars is not a problem, but adapters we need to fix. And we also have a lot of these boats. Fishing is the second biggest export article in Norway, and we cover, uh, cover uh, the DAB signals 50 kilometers out of the shore. This is a very interesting uh, figure because people said that we don't need new content. But if you look at the, the usage, people that tune into radio, more than half of them actually uses one of those stations we could never have made on FM because of lack of frequencies. It's not the share, it's not the, the amount of listening time, but they listen to their favorite station, but suddenly they want a little jazz, they want a little sport, they want a little news, maybe the children sitting in the car want a special program. So we know that they use the digital content, the new content. 74% of the Norwegian population do have one or more DAB radios. So the audience, they follow. Uh, yeah, I, I skipped this one, but this is an interesting, uh, I'm sorry it's uh, only Norwegian, but this is uh, uh, equipment of, of radios. The red one is the area where we have shut off FM. So more people have DAB radios in that compared to the rest of the national 
uh, the country. Meaning, when we shut off, people go and buy radios. And today, I guess it would be even more. This is the same figure about cars. So, um, in 11th of, 11th of January, we did an event up in Nordland, where we have uh, uh, an event where, with an orchestra and, uh, and musicians and so on. And there were all of the, all of the um, bosses from the um, stations, the ministry were there and so on. And uh, we did a countdown. You can see uh, now it's 10 minutes and 54 seconds till FM is gone. So what we did was we picked one of the listeners, a 76-year-old lady who was the one who actually could do the physical shutoff. And we all counted, you know, 10, 9, 8, and so on. And 3, 2, 1, FM is gone. We're 100% digital. And then... It was all over the world. So this is Donald Trump, but look at the bottom line there. Norway starts switching off FM. Oh, yes. Okay, to sum up. This we do to secure the radio position in the media market. Otherwise, radio would just f slowly vanish. You need to cooperate uh, with commercial and public radio stations, and you need a political plan. We are on schedule. We, uh, next Wednesday, on the 8th, we shut off the second region. We have great coverage. It's almost everywhere you can get signal. We offer the audience new content with 30 compared to five radio stations. National, then, of course, comes all the locals. 74% of the households have at least one DAB radio. We do focus on the car industry, especially the adapters. That's the aftermarket, and that's the big, big, uh, uh, big, big challenge. So, uh, thank you for your attention. And if we, can, if we do have time, Bernie, can you nod your head? Can we play the video? Yes. Uh, I'll play a video uh, in the end here where Vice or HBO made a report. So this is not my uh, impressions. This is what went on HBO television. Uh, of uh, it's a little, Norway it's edited, the but this is um, the world to shut down its FM radio network. Vo volume. The country will soon complete the switch to a vastly cheaper and more reliable digital radio known as DAB. The change is inevitable, and Norway's made history by being the first country to adopt it. But as usual, not everyone is excited about stepping boldly into the future. Hörde du dette? Hörde du på FM? Onsdag 11. januar klocka 11:11 slutte NRK och sände på FM i Norrland. För att fortsätt och hör på våra kanaler, må du göra det via DAB+, nettradio eller TV. Across Norway, many of the country's 3 million radio listeners will be forced to switch off or make a change. That's because by the end of the year, all of the FM radio masts will be shut down, starting with this one in the Norland province. The antenna at the top is uh, for the TV, and then it's uh, analog and digital uh, radio. Officials argue that Norway's mountains and valleys interfere more with the FM analog signal than digital. That means more transmitters are needed, making it around eight times more expensive to maintain. It's 11, 11 today, the uh, FM signals uh, and radio signals will be shut down. This uh, transmitter here is the first transmitter in the world that will go shut down permanently. Norland is the first province to close down the FM signal. By the end of April, almost half of all the provinces in Norway will have turned off the analog network. Finally, on December 13th, the last FM mast will be shut down leaving the entire country, except for a small number of community radio stations, without FM channels. Denmark, Switzerland and the United Kingdom will be watching what happens closely, having also voiced a desire to follow suit. Thor Eriksson is the head of broadcasting at Norway's NRK, which runs three of the five national FM radio stations in the country. He insists that listeners will receive an improved service, with a more diverse range of stations. I think we we are ready. And, you know, 
switch hours like this. Uh, we cannot wait to everyone is ready. Norway has become the first country in the world to shut down Thank its... You. Thank yeah. you very Thank much, you so uh, much. Jorn, and good luck for the switchover this year. Coming next, uh, we are going to have Jean-Éric Valli, who is going to, st to talk for uh, Les Indes Radio. Uh, we are going to have a panel with Antoine Baduel, president of Radio FG, who is broadcasting in France and in Germany. And he's going to hold a panel with Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands. And we are going to finish with Nicolas Curien, who is the board member of the CSA, the French regulator. But we are going now to welcome Marcel Regnoto, the head of media section in Ofcom of Switzerland. Ofcom is the regulator of Switzerland. Euh, bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Pour ne pas heurter vos oreilles, je préfère m'adresser en français à vous pour vous inviter à faire un petit tour euh, en Suisse et, et faire l'état des lieux de la radio numérique. Euh, où en sommes-nous euh, Aujourd'hui, vous pouvez capter euh, 127 programmes en euh, DAB+. Ce sont des programmes qui sont déjà disponibles euh, sur la bande FM, mais il y a aussi des programmes qui ont été... Euh, constitué spécialement pour le DAB+, ou d'autres qui euh, sont déjà euh, édités sur euh, le net. Sur l'ensemble du territoire suisse, vous avez en moyenne 2 à 4 couvertures DAB en fonction, euh, avec une petite exception qui euh, concerne la Suisse italienne, au sud de la, de la Suisse, où il n'y a pour l'instant que, je dirais, une couverture et demie en fonction. Euh, ce qui est déjà important, c'est que tous les programmes radio du service public national sont transmis en simulcast en numérique et pratiquement tous les programmes des diffuseurs privés qui euh, généralement euh, proposent leurs programmes en FM. Sur les 42 stations privées qui euh, ont une licence pour la FM, 40 proposent déjà leurs programmes en euh, DAB. La couverture technique avoisine les 98%, et on a parlé déjà beaucoup maintenant de l'industrie automobile. Là aussi, il y a des euh, signaux euh, très réjouissants. Euh, 600 000 véhicules sur un parc euh, automobile qui en compte 4,8 millions sont d'ores et déjà équipés en DAB+, et deux tiers des voitures qui sont livrées d'usine sont équipées de récepteurs DAB+. Il y a encore du chemin à faire, mais je crois que ça a pris le, le bon tournant. Et ce qui était important aussi pour euh, l'industrie euh, automobile, nous avons l'assurance des, des autorités que jusqu'à la fin 2018, tous les tunnels importants autoroutiers seront équipés de DAB+. Et le public, avec tout ça, eh bien, il semble gentiment adopter le nouveau standard. 3 millions de récepteurs DAB+, ont été vendus jusqu'à ce jour, et euh, fait historique, euh, en, euh, en été de l'année passée, euh, le, le taux d'écoute de, de radio numérique, donc par DAB+, et par euh, euh, Internet, a dépassé l'utilisation de la FM. Donc aujourd'hui, moins d'un euh, auditeur sur deux écoute la FM, et plus de la moitié écoute soit euh, DAB+, soit l'Internet. Et ce qui est important de noter, c'est que ce n'est pas simplement dû à, à l'essor euh, de, de l'Internet, mais aussi euh, euh, au progrès fait par DAB+. Les deux participent dans la même proportion à cette évolution. Ce bilan intermédiaire réjouissant est le fruit d'un travail de longue haleine mené par l'ensemble du secteur de la radio. L'éditeur de, de services publics, la SSR, s'est jointe aux associations des radios commerciales et associatives déjà en 2013 pour créer un groupe de travail qui s'était fixé comme objectif d'élaborer un scénario pour la migration vers le DAB+. Le travail s'est structuré de manière suivante. Donc, il y a trois sous-groupes qui ont été créés pour toucher tous les aspects réglementaires, de communication technique liés au basculement. Et euh, l'OFCOM, moi-même, j'ai eu le plaisir de présider le, le groupe de pilotage de tous ces travaux. Euh, tous ces travaux ont abouti dans la rédaction d'un rapport final qui a été remis le 1er décembre à notre ministre compétente. 
ce rapport. Vous pouvez d'ailleurs toujours le consulter sur notre site internet euh, en tout temps. Quel est le, le plan dessiné par les acteurs du euh, secteur radio pour arriver à la radio numérique Ce processus est divisé en deux phases. Lors de la première phase, qui est en, en pleine évolution, donc jusqu'à fin 2019, l'idée est d'inciter les radios, euh, par des mesures de soutien, à proposer leur programme aussi sur DAB. Et dans une deuxième phase, à partir de 2020, l'idée est d'éteindre gentiment, un après l'autre, les émetteurs FM. Euh, L'exécution de ce plan nécessite bien évidemment un engagement très fort de la part des autorités publiques. Dès à présent, les normes en vigueur nous donnent la possibilité de euh, donner un soutien très consistant euh, à la transition numérique. Nous sommes en mesure de prendre à notre charge 80% des coûts générés par euh, la diffusion numérique pendant la phase de transition. De plus, les radios souhaitent une prolongation de leur titre d'utilisation de la bande FM jusqu'en fin 2024 ou plus tard pour pouvoir choisir elles-mêmes le moment opportun pour quitter définitivement la bande FM. Dans ces conditions, le secteur accepte d'assumer la responsabilité pour l'établissement d'un calendrier de la, pour l'extension de la FM. Donc, très important, ce n'est pas... L'autorité, ce ne sera pas l'OFCOM, ce ne sera pas le Conseil fédéral qui dira à quel moment euh, l'FM sera éteinte. Ce seront les acteurs des médias, donc la radio publique, les radios privées, qui décideront d'un commun accord euh, la date euh, la plus opportune pour euh, éteindre euh, la FM. Je, je sais que pour les, les auditeurs français, rien qu'évoquer la, la pure possibilité d'éteindre la, la FM à quelque chose d'hérétique, je vais euh, tenter de vous expliquer pourquoi en Suisse, on n'en est peut-être pas encore à ce point, mais en tout cas, ce n'est plus un tabou. Le, le Conseil fédéral, donc notre gouvernement, a dès le départ soutenu le DAB+. Et cela parce qu'en Suisse, le, la pénurie de fréquence FM est patente. Et très tôt, les autorités ont vu dans la RNT un moyen pour pouvoir augmenter euh, l'offre euh, RTN, tant en termes d'opinion que de pluralité de choix. Deuxième avantage de la RNT pour nous, c'est qu'elle met, elle donne l'égalité des chances à toutes les stations qui sont euh, transmises sur une même plateforme. C'est la fin des, des guéguerres de voisins euh, dont on est habitué dans la, sur la bande FM, où chacun se plaint que le voisin a de meilleures conditions de, de transmission. Avec la RNT, c'est terminé, sont, tous sont logés à la même enseigne. Et à la fin, ça me semble aussi important, euh, la RNT donne à la radio, aux diffuseurs, euh, une possibilité de nouveau de reprendre un, un peu de, de la latitude de décision pour décider eux-mêmes quelle doit être euh, la latitude de, de leur euh, couverture. Là où il y a plusieurs couvertures de, de tailles différentes, la, la radio peut choisir à quel niveau elle veut étendre sa diffusion. Le secteur s'est rallié à, à l'opinion des autorités. Je pense que cette adhésion n'était pas le fruit maintenant d'un du, euh, grand enthousiasme débordant. C'est plutôt, je crois, le, le résultat d'une réflexion bien mûrie, bien réfléchie. Euh, le, notre gouvernement a, dès 2006, déjà indiqué à plusieurs reprises que pour lui, l'avenir de la radio était numérique et non plus analogique. Et le, le secteur de la radio a compris que s'il voulait éviter de se faire imposer, dans le pire des cas, un calendrier qui ne lui conviendrait pas, il valait peut-être mieux prendre le taureau par les cornes et s'organiser de manière autonome. Mis à part ça, les radios ont bien évidemment aussi trouvé leur, leur avantage dans la RNT. En Suisse, jusqu'à l'essor de la RNT, la couverture des grandes régions linguistiques était monopolisée par le service public. Il n'y avait pas de fréquence, pas de radio publique au niveau des grandes régions linguistiques. DAB change la donne et donne la possibilité aussi aux radios privées maintenant d'accéder à de nouveaux marchés qui jusqu'à présent leur étaient clos. Et euh, sur un point, tous les diffuseurs euh, concordent, on est de plus en plus conscient de l'importance de sauvegarder une technologie euh, dédiée de, de diffusion qui soit vraiment dédiée à la radio, du broadcasting, parce que sinon, euh, c'est la crainte de, de beaucoup de directeurs de stations, euh, la dépendance vis-à-vis -vis des grands acteurs du monde des télécoms et euh, d'Internet risque d'être très grande et de, de s'exercer au détriment des stations de radio. 
quels sont les prochains pas qui nous attendent Ce printemps, euh, notre ministre de tutelle, euh, qui est aussi présidente de la Confédération euh, cette année, va très vraisemblablement libérer des fréquences ou des blocs supplémentaires dans les trois régions linguistiques, parce que nous avons toujours une, une, une attente très forte euh, de, de nouveaux opérateurs qui voudraient pouvoir proposer du DAB+. En automne de cette année, le gouvernement aura l'occasion de, euh, de prendre position de manière officielle à ce scénario et, euh, élaboré par le secteur. Et s'il si accepte, eh bien, les prolongations des, du droit d'utilisation des fréquences FM sera prolongée dans les années qui viennent jusqu'à fin 2024 ou plus tard. Voilà, ça, c'est la politique fiction. Je reviendrai pour vous dire ce qu'il en sera dans quelques années. Merci beaucoup. Voilà. So we are going to welcome Jean-Éric Valli, the president of Les Indes Radio, which is a groupment of uh, commercial radios in France, local uh, commercial radios in France, that uh, have been uh, part of the launch of uh, DAB uh, in uh, France uh, with the CSA. This presentation is going to be in French as well. Hi, Jean-Éric. Bonjour à tous. Euh, Peut-être un petit tour d'horizon très rapide sur ce que sont les Indes Radio euh, aujourd'hui. C'est une euh, audience de, de 8,4 millions d'auditeurs quotidiens. Euh, 132 stations euh, qui réalisent cette audience. Vous le voyez sur euh, le, le paysage de la radio en France. Nous sommes un leader de cette audience. Une couverture d'à peu près 92% du territoire national. Alors je crois qu'on partage cette idée avec les précédents interlocuteurs. On pense que la radio a en effet un bel avenir devant elle, mais il faut qu'elle sache se renouveler, s'appuyer sur ses points forts, bien sûr, que sont le contenu de ses programmes et notamment le caractère humain de ses programmes. C'est une notion très importante. Et ce contenu doit être diffusé dans des, des, des conditions euh, euh, optimales. Et c'est euh, la raison pour laquelle on s'intéresse également à la radio numérique terrestre, euh, au DAB. Euh, on pense que euh, cette euh, habitude que les auditeurs euh, prennent petit à petit euh, euh, d'écouter un son digital, notamment sur Internet, mais aussi euh, lorsqu'ils écoutent leur propre disque, eh bien, il faut euh, également y répondre euh, dans le, le domaine de la radio. Alors, j'ai euh, entendu dans les, les, les précédentes présentations, je ne vais pas euh, répéter euh, les choses, euh, qu'il euh, fallait aussi qu'on veille à ne pas être dépendant euh, des acteurs d'Internet qui peuvent euh, tout à fait filtrer euh, nos flux et les délivrer au rythme qu'ils veulent, euh, moyennant finance. Donc je pense qu'en effet, le broadcasting, c'est quelque chose de très important euh, pour, pour la radio. Euh, on diffuse aujourd'hui en FM et sur Internet. Euh, on commence à diffuser euh, en DAB. Euh, il y a euh, 26 radios parmi euh, les radios euh, indépendantes euh, qui euh, diffusent d'ores et déjà sur euh, Paris, Marseille et Nice. Il y en a 23 qui ont été euh, sélectionnés par le CSA tout récemment sur euh, Lille, euh, Lyon et Strasbourg. Et on, on compte euh, sur euh, la, la suite de ce, de ce déploiement euh, qu'organise le, le CSA euh, pour faire grandir cette, cette diffusion et, euh, et accompagner cette mutation. Il euh, y a un point que j'ai noté aussi, c'est le pragmatisme de la Suisse en matière d'arrêt de, de, des émissions FM. Et euh, on pense exactement la même chose en France, on ne doit pas mettre la charrue avant les bœufs. On émet en FM, on a un public très grand en FM. Et euh, la, le DAB est quelque chose de supplémentaire, et qui n'est pas forcément une alternative, et en tout cas pas forcément une alternative dans, dans toutes les villes du pays. Je pense qu'il faut bien observer la situation. Euh, être pragmatique en fait, par rapport à, à la situation, à, à, la, à la réaction en fait, euh, du public. C'est vraiment euh, vers le public que notre attention euh, est portée. Et sur ce point-là, je voudrais insister sur un point qui peut paraître euh, 
euh, très évident, mais qu'on oublie finalement souvent, et, 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 et y compris à l'intérieur des radios, euh, c'est que lorsqu'on est un auditeur de radio, on, on a besoin de ressentir euh, à l'antenne d'une radio euh, de l'émotion, mais aussi euh, dans un cadre technique euh, le meilleur possible. Et donc la qualité du son est un point extrêmement important. Euh, le DAB apporte cette qualité. Et j'oserais dire, je crois que dans la pratique, euh, il apporte une qualité supérieure à ce que l'on connaît dans les flux Internet, le stream que l'on peut écouter les uns les autres. Si vous y prêtez attention, ce stream est variable en fait, parce que tel agrégateur va restructurer le signal qu'il reçoit, ne va pas forcément le diffuser dans la qualité optimale. Et le point d'ailleurs très problématique, c'est que ce n'est pas la radio qui décide, c'est l'agrégateur, c'est la box télé qui, ou n'importe quel en fait support intermédiaire qui décide de la qualité du son. Et ça, c'est un problème extrêmement important. Euh, dans le, le DAB, on retrouve en fait la liberté qu'on a dans la FM euh, de traiter le son euh, de la façon qui nous paraît la plus appropriée par rapport à nos programmes. Donc il faut faire attention à, à cet aspect euh, euh, qui peut paraître acquis, mais qui ne l'est pas forcément. Euh, gardons à l'esprit que, que les gens, euh, le public est de plus en plus exigeant et, et cherche à, à, à améliorer, en fait, à, à choisir des programmes euh, qui sont les, les, les plus adaptés à, à ses souhaits personnels. Donc voilà ce, ce petit état des lieux euh, très bref que je voulais euh, faire sur le DAB. On, on compte euh, sur ce déploiement euh, dans un esprit euh, très pragmatique euh, qui tienne compte euh, de nos réalités qui sont aussi des réalités économiques. Euh, en matière de radio euh, indépendante, on a euh, une typologie de radio qui a une vocation à se développer si ce n'est nationalement, mais en tout cas sur les, les principales agglomérations. On a aussi euh, énormément de radios, et c'est la majorité, qui ont plutôt une vocation à se développer d'un point de vue régional, c'est-à-dire sur plein de, de villes différentes. Et euh, on doit aussi euh, pouvoir exploiter le DAB dans ce contexte-là, euh, donc dans une diffusion euh, monoprogramme, comme dans une diffusion euh, où on a euh, plusieurs programmes avec des décrochages, etc. Euh, la réalité euh, économique, il euh, ne faut jamais euh, trop l'oublier, sinon il euh, n'y a pas de liberté. Euh, voilà, je vous remercie. Parfait. Ouais, parfait. Merci, merci Jean-Eric. Uh, so we are going, uh, I'm going to welcome uh, Antoine Baduel, who is the president of uh, Radio FG uh, in France. And we are going to welcome our panel of speakers uh, from Germany, Belgium and Netherlands. I'll let you speak. Antoine. Merci. Uh, good morning, everybody. So we're going to host our panelists today. We're going to talk about the situation in the neighborhood countries, about DAB, DAB development and implantation and implementation. So our speakers today are Jacqueline Bierhorst from Netherlands. She's project director and in charge of the Digital Radio Netherlands and committed and involved in several radio stations and network in the Netherlands. Nicolas Brezou, digital radio manager for the RTBF, the Bonjour public uh, service and radio and television in the French part of Belgium. And Carsten Turga, uh, he's a director of and in charge of digital radio bureau in Deutschland. Um, nous allons parler tout d'abord, alors ce sera un panel uh, plutôt bilingue puisque nous allons uh, à la fois donner la parole uh, à nos amis uh, uh, Jacqueline et, et Carsten en anglais mais également en français avec uh, Nicolas afin de parler justement de la situation des différents pays voisins uh, européens quant au développement du DAB mais en préambule je voulais accueillir monsieur Nicolas Curien qui est membre du collège du CSA uh, que l'on connaît bien euh, en tant qu'acteur euh, et éditeur de programmes radiophoniques puisqu'il est jusqu'à demain. Jusqu Vice-président du groupe de travail radio et qu'il connaît bien la filière radiophonique. Nicolas Curien, bonjour. Bonjour Antoine, euh, bonjour panélistes. Et en préambule euh, de, de cette, euh, comment dirais-je, de cette euh, présentation de, de nos pays voisins, eh bien... On parle beaucoup du DAB, évidemment, en France. Euh, où en est la situation et comment voyez-vous aujourd'hui, le, j'allais dire, le, le déploiement Il y a eu un certain nombre d'appels qui ont été euh, révélés et, et, et présélectionnés. On, Lyon, Lille, Strasbourg, l'Alsace, donc le Nord et la région euh, Rhône-Alpes. Qu'en est-il dorénavant pour les années qui viennent 
Bon, alors avant d'en venir au fond de vos questions, mon cher Antoine, j'aimerais tout d'abord saluer dans la salle Patrice Gélinet. Patrice Gélinet, qui a été pendant six ans, je crois, président du, du groupe radio, et sans l'enthousiasme duquel je ne serais certainement pas en train de vous parler aujourd'hui de la RNT en France. Il en a été un, un artisan à la fois enthousiaste et, et moteur. Et la RNT lui doit beaucoup. Et la RNT lui doit beaucoup. Alors la deuxième remarque liminaire, c'est que le paquebot CSA fait escale tous les deux ans. Il y a deux membres de l'équipage, trois membres de l'équipage sont descendus, euh, deux montent, et pendant cette semaine d'escale, on est un peu dans une situation d'apesanteur où les groupes de travail ne sont pas encore euh, réaffectés. Donc je ne peux pas vous parler aujourd'hui en tant que euh, président du groupe radio, puisque le groupe radio n'a pas encore de président, ça décidera demain, mais j'ai confiance. Alors, il y a aussi une troisième remarque liminaire importante, c'est que je vais vous faire part de quelques idées à la demande d'Antoine, mais je ne suis pas aujourd'hui le porte-parole du CSA. Vous savez que le CSA, c'est un organisme collégial, et par conséquent, les idées que je peux avancer aujourd'hui devront être discutées en collège avant de pouvoir être traduites en une éventuelle feuille de route. Et puis, dernière remarque liminaire sur la forme, non seulement ces questions méritent d'être discutées au sein du collège, mais aussi, bien sûr, en concertation avec le secteur. C'est-à-dire que l'avenir de la RNT en France, c'est un avenir collectif, construit au sein du collège du CSA, en concertation avec le secteur. Donc, ce n'est pas purement de prudence ou de précaution oratoire de ma part, c'est vraiment une question de, de méthode. Alors, j'ai encore une dernière remarque liminaire, celle-là plus sur le fond, qui est que le déploiement de la RNT dans un pays, c'est extrêmement, comme disent les anglo-saxons, context dependent. On ne peut pas concevoir le déploiement de la radio numérique de la même façon dans un pays de 5 millions d'habitants où la population est concentrée dans, dans quelques villes côtières, de la même façon qu'on le fait pour un pays entre 60 et 70 millions d'habitants, dont 40% de la population habite en dehors des, des zones urbaines. Les coûts de déploiement ne sont pas les mêmes, le temps, la constante de temps de la dynamique non plus. Donc, chaque pays nécessite une analyse contextuelle précise et à des spécificités différentes, pas seulement d'ailleurs démographiques, et géographique, ça dépend aussi de l'état des stations FM, du nombre de ces stations, de leur répartition, de leur santé. Ça dépend aussi de savoir si l'état s'est engagé dans un grand plan d'investissement ou si le schéma est davantage comme en France, un schéma où le régulateur attribue les fréquences et ensuite le développement se fait en fonction de la réponse des acteurs du marché. Donc à chaque pays, euh, ses spécificités et donc à chaque pays sa stratégie efficace de déploiement de la RNT. Alors c'est vrai, on a dit que la France n'est pas particulièrement en avance en matière de, de RNT. Euh, c'est pas parce qu'on n'est pas en avance, voire qu'on est en retard, qu'il faut se précipiter, courir, attraper à tout prix euh, les autres. Ça veut dire plutôt qu'il faut faire les bonnes choses au bon moment et assez rapidement. Et donc ma conviction et c'est ce que j'aimerais évidemment mettre autour de la table du collège du CSA et aussi en discuter avec vous, c'est qu'il faut envisager des actions et des chantiers qui soient bien circonscrits à la fois dans l'espace et dans le temps, dans la stratégie de, de couverture et dans le calendrier de couverture. Alors je, je me réfère, on peut quand même se référer aux, aux paroles du président du CSA, Olivier Schramek, lors de son discours des vœux, il a mentionné deux choses. La poursuite du calendrier de déploiement régional, dont vient de parler aussi Jean-Éric Valli, d'une part, et d'autre part, l'usage éventuel qu'on pourrait faire de la ressource nationale, radioélectrique nationale en RNT, qui a été jusqu'à présent mise en réserve et qui pourrait être employée notamment pour développer des multiplexes nationaux couvrant les grands axes autoroutiers et routiers. Alors, s'agissant d'abord du déploiement régional, 
grâce à Patrice Gélinet, on est loin de partir de zéro. La RNT existe déjà à Paris, à Nice, à Marseille. Le paysage est tout à fait euh, encourageant, même si évidemment la photo euh, n'est pas parfaite, certains multiplex n'ayant pas démarré ou d'autres étant <rire> que partiellement remplis. Ça veut dire que probablement, il faudra à terme rationaliser un peu l'organisation de ces multiplex dans ces trois villes. Deuxième temps, on a lancé, ça a été rappelé tout à l'heure, euh, à l'été 2016, un appel aux candidatures dans les villes de Lille, Lyon et Strasbourg, et il a été procédé au tout début de cette année euh, à la sélection. Alors les leçons, les enseignements plutôt que les leçons, euh, qu'on a tirées de cet appel, c'est que si l'appétence des acteurs est vive pour les allotissements étendus, ou les allotissements locaux portant sur les centres des grandes agglomérations, l'appétence est un peu moindre pour les allotissements locaux en dehors des grandes agglos. Donc, pour le prochain appel, le tout prochain appel, qui va être lancé dans les villes de Toulouse, enfin dans les zones de Toulouse, Nantes et Rouen, nous voudrions profiter de ces enseignements. Et je crois que la première réunion de travail avec les acteurs du secteur aura lieu demain, pour vous présenter la géométrie qu'on envisage pour ces allotissements dans ces zones-là, l'idée serait probablement de concentrer les allotissements en priorité sur les bassins de population importants, c'est-à-dire les centres des grandes agglos et les centres des villes moyennes, là où il y a de la demande, pour éviter d'avoir à ouvrir dans un premier temps des multiplexes qui ne rencontreraient pas suffisamment d'intérêt. Évidemment, la suite sera poursuivie. Vous savez que le, le, le Conseil a publié un calendrier qui mène jusqu'en 2023. Il me semble, mais là encore, c'est une question qui doit être mise sur la table, que notre détermination et notre pragmatisme pourra s'accommoder de quelques réglages. Et mon idée est qu'on pourrait peut-être raccourcir l'horizon, rapprocher plutôt l'horizon de ce calendrier, si au lieu de procéder trois zones par trois zones, on procédait par exemple cinq zones par cinq zones, mais en se concentrant au moins dans un premier temps sur les centres des grandes agglomérations. Donc là, un des points que j'ai même mettre à la discussion du collège et à la concertation avec les acteurs, c'est le réglage de ce calendrier dans sa dimension temporelle et dans sa dimension spatiale, c'est-à-dire dans le degré de densification qui pourrait au début porter sur les centres-villes et si ça marche, ensuite, relever d'une densification ultérieure. C'est une option par rapport euh, au calendrier jusqu'ici affiché. Je ne suis pas le porte-papa en mesure aujourd'hui de vous euh, afficher cela comme une stratégie, mais je vous fais part de mon idée, de ce que j'aimerais mettre à la discussion. La deuxième grande composante euh, de ce que nous pourrions faire, c'est... Euh, réveiller cette euh, ressource euh, nationale. Et je salue aussi Philippe euh, Levrier, qui a longtemps été promoteur du projet R+. Et j'aimerais que, euh, tel la belle au bois dormant, le projet R+, euh, puisse euh, revoir le jour et surtout rencontrer l'intérêt d'un certain nombre de grandes radios. Alors il me semble, en tout cas en tant qu'auditeur automobiliste, qu'il y a une vraie demande pour ce type de déploiement. D'ailleurs, la première fois que j'ai entendu parler de la RNT, j'étais bien loin à ce moment-là de penser que j'atterrirais un jour au CSA, quand on parlait de la RNT, c'était plutôt de ça qu'on parlait, c'est-à-dire la continuité pour l'automobiliste, la possibilité de suivre une écoute en continu sans changer la fréquence de son, de son poste et sans perdre sa station, soit parce que la fréquence ne lui est plus attribuée sur une zone de 10 km, soit parce que la fréquence à glisser. Donc je pense qu'il y a une vraie demande du point de vue de l'expérience utilisateur pour disposer d'une écoute continue radio en mobilité. Bon, comme toujours, c'est la poule et l'œuf. Il faut, si on s'engage là-dedans, il faut évidemment qu'il y ait un minimum de répondants du côté des, euh, des radios, que les constructeurs automobiles embrayent. Bon. Mais je pense que du point de vue de l'appel de la demande, l'intérêt de la chose est assez indiscutable. Donc c'est la deuxième grande chose que j'aimerais mettre autour de la table du Collège du, 
du CSA et de la table de la concertation avec les, les acteurs du marché. Alors en résumé, bon, donc je reviens sur, mon, sur ma formule, plus on est en retard, plus il faut faire des choses ciblées qui ont des chances de marcher vite. Et donc mon idée, c'est encore une idée à débattre, soumise à la discussion et au sein du collège et avec le marché, serait de mener en parallèle un déploiement peut-être un peu accéléré et concentré sur les centres-villes et d'engager un projet de, multiplex, de deux multiplexes nationaux sur le modèle de la distribution et euh, visant à couvrir les grands axes de nos routes et de nos autoroutes en mobilité RNT. Bon, je reviens sur mes précautions oratoires et liminaires du début. Je vous ai dit très franchement et sans langue de bois ce que j'ai dans la tête. Maintenant, tout ça ne peut pas se faire sans évidemment euh, être converti préalablement en une décision mûrie du Collège du CSA et sans être évidemment discuté en concertation étroite avec le secteur. Voilà mon cher euh, Antoine. Ce que merci, je merci Nicolas Curien en tous les cas pour euh, ces annonces. Ce n'est pas des annonces. C'est des... en tous les cas ces intentions. Oui. Voilà. Euh, c'est vrai que c'est très intéressant en tous les cas d'évoquer euh, la situation de l'audience de du média radio dans les voitures, qui aujourd'hui, de fait, reste le dernier endroit où ce média est en situation de monopole, de fait, et qu'effectivement, euh, considérer cette spécificité et, euh, en tous les cas, la sanctuariser et, et, la, et la valoriser est un sujet, à un moment où le média connaît, en tous les cas, une certaine crise et certains questionnements avec l'arrivée des plateformes digitales et, et, et de l'IP. Merci beaucoup, Nicolas Curien. Merci à vous, Antoine. Et la transition, quelque part, est toute trouvée, puisque, comme le disait Nicolas Curien en, en préambule et en introduction de son, de son discours et, de, son, et de, ses, de sa prise de parole, c'est vrai que chaque pays à ses spécificités, à ses particularités, et qu'il est indispensable aussi de considérer chaque marché par rapport aussi à sa taille, à son déploiement. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle on pensait qu'il était vraiment intéressant et important, dans le cadre de, cette, de, ce, de ces échanges et de cette table ronde, de parler aussi de la situation de nos voisins. Ce qui nous mène euh, tout droit maintenant au, au, au panel suivant, où nous allons parler euh, justement de la situation du déploiement du DAB dans trois pays, les Pays-Bas, la Belgique, euh, en particulier la Belgique francophone et euh, l'Allemagne. Now we're going to speak in English again uh, with the, the, our neighbors and the neighborhood and the implementation of DAB in several countries such as Netherlands, Deutschland and the French part of Belgium. Jacqueline, Jacqueline Bierhorst. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, why did your country, Netherlands, decide to implement the AB Plus? Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having me here. And um, I'd love to tell you something about that. Um, because FM is full. You saw it already today in earlier presentations. The FM spectrum is full. And uh, therefore, in the end, uh, after a lot of hesitation in the beginning, because uh, we decided uh, private and public broadcasters all together to uh, implement DAB Plus together with the government. And how did, you, did your country secure the stakeholder? I mean, all the uh, radio stations from public to private station to, to commercial station, national to local station, how did you secure their commitment? Well, it, it, it didn't only went top down from governmental to as an obligation but also down and up so it has been a uh, stakeholders communication all the way with this with the decision taken all together that we believe in digitalization and it has some advantages for the commercial broadcasters for example the best commercial fm network that we have in the netherlands is from a station that's called q music which does not have a 100% coverage in our country. So although the commercial broadcasters are very big and financially depending on the FM, the FM distribution was not really sufficient and still is not really sufficient. Um, and DAB Plus has a coverage 
which is nationwide. So in the end, the nine license holders of FM frequencies joined forces and united their forces and uh, exploit a multiplex on DAB+. How is the relationship between all the actors of radio industry, I mean, of course, radio stations, regulator, and, and um, public, commercial, and car industry? Do you have any relationship, I mean, in order to have all those devices immediately available for a person, for someone who buys a car? How is the equipment like? Do you have special relationships between these, those two industries? Yes, we do. Uh, we, what we first did is we uh, put up a stakeholders, uh, a stakeholders meeting between government, public broadcaster and commercial broadcaster. Then we made a plan of approach in communication, in marketing. So we have one message to everybody, uh, whether you're a listener or whether you're um, a car manufacturer or a manufacturer or a retailer or an e-tailer. It's one message all over uh, all the radio stations because it's all of them sent out the same commercials on DAB Plus Digital Radio. And because we are very clear on our message, we could also be very clear through Digital Radio NL, which uh, my colleagues are from Digital Radio Norway or Digital Radio UK or Digital Radio Germany. Um, um, uh, we also have a Digital Radio NL, which, uh, and from that project office, we talk to car manufacturers but not only in the Netherlands, the importers of cars, but also on a level that we combine all our knowledge in Europe. So we have one message out from, for example, World DAB and our colleagues there to talk to the car manufacturers. So they know that what we do and how we promote it, it's not only for the Netherlands because it's a very tiny country and you don't adapt cars just for the Netherlands. You adapt them because it's a worldwide thing. So we can be very clear on that. But on top of that, we have promotions like three and a half or four million euro worth yearly in communicating that digital radio DAB Plus is there and what the benefits are as you are a listener. And not that you have to buy a radio, but if you, are, if you need to buy a new car, then please think about it that it is a DAB Plus car. Yeah, and that's a point because, for instance, in France, where DAB is, I mean, starting, even if we already have three cities already broadcasting uh, with this format and on this platform like Paris, Nice and Marseille, as Nicolas Curien said a couple of minutes ago, we, this is obvious that DAB is available in several models and several cars because in Germany, because in the Netherlands, in Belgium, in, in Switzerland, Italy, this platform is now available and it is much easier for the countries that are a little bit late um, yeah. because the implementation of this norm and this platform that is to say Bond 3 is already available in several cars and brands and that's pretty interesting. We were talking about no way Jacqueline and of course the digital switchover of uh, FM. What about the DSO in your country? We did not plan a DSO date uh, yet, because for us, it's not the fact that we need to switch off FM. It will happen eventually, but it's an organic process. It's much more important to have a good and healthy digital radio world available for all listeners in a hybrid situation. So it's both online as uh, DAB+. And then, when listening, we expect in 2023 that more than 70% of all listening will be digital. So if that is the case, we also th start thinking about switching off antennas. Perhaps not all at the same time, but it's too soon now and too early now to say. But what we do see is that there's a very quick organic growth into digital listening, because it's already happening, if you want it or not. And there's a point, uh, Jacqueline, you are, um, of course, an expert on the Netherlands, but also, of course, Belgium is a small country, but a bilingual country. So there are two situations because there are two regulators. On the hand, in the hand, you have the VRM, which is the Vlamish regulator. Of course, 
they are Belgish commitments between VRM and CSA and the French speaking stations. Uh, we're going to talk with you, Nicola, in a couple of minutes uh, later. But first, I'd like to know a little bit more um, because Belgium is a bilingual country and there is the Flemish uh, um, uh, part of Belgium. Of course, it's the same language than in the Le Netherlands. Do you have any uh, synchronization? Yeah. How is the commitment? Because at the moment, there is already a platform, uh, um, a multiplex that is being broadcasted in the, Nether in the French, the Flemish, sorry, part the Flemish. of the Flemish part of Belgium. Yes. So how are you working together? Um, yeah, we do, because car manufacturers don't uh, only uh, buy in there, or the importers don't do that only for the Netherlands, but also for Flanders and for Wallonia. So it's one market, actually. Uh, but it's also so for, the, for Philips or Pure. They don't produce their radios just for the Netherlands. It's for all over Europe. So the same language is spoken in Flanders. In Flanders, um, DAB Plus will be implemented in a, in a way that also the big national uh, commercial broadcasters will be on DAB Plus, ultimately per September 2018. And it's not even that bad to be later than other countries that already even started switch over like Norway, because you have all the benefits and all the learnings. And as, as soon as you start and switch over, you have the benefits right now. Merci beaucoup, Jacqueline. La transition est tout trouvée puisque forcément, 2018, oui. nous, nous parlons de 2018. Nous allons reparler d'ailleurs en, en, en français. Finalement, quelque part, si je dois synthétiser le point de vue de, de, de Jacqueline, euh, les propos de, de Nicolas Curien il y a quelques minutes, quelque part, quand on considère aujourd'hui le, le, le DAB+, on se rend compte qu'aujourd'hui, c'est en tous les cas une plateforme qui permet de pallier ou de rééquilibrer les carences et les saturations de la FM. La FM est complètement saturée en, en qui... Belgique francophone également. Et, et naturellement, dans un pays euh, comme la Belgique euh, francophone, où vous avez deux euh, régulateurs, un plan de fréquence qui est forcément euh, compliqué parce que euh, des radios des publiques interférences. et des interférences, un pays fr... deux frontières euh, très, euh, comment dirais-je, marquées avec des paysages radiophoniques très denses, comme le nord de la France, mais également le, 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 le sud des Pays-Bas. Comment, comment, comment avez-vous considéré, euh, euh, Nicolas, le, la, la partie justement du développement du DAB+, donc avant tout, c'est tout l'avantage du DAB+, le, le, le digital et, et ses avantages, le confort d'écoute, la qualité d'écoute euh, et justement toutes ces perturbations qu'on n'aura plus euh, à l'avenir, euh, la FM saturée aujourd'hui. Donc l'importance de, de passer en DAB+, euh, et les, euh, les spécifications le, ou la particularité de la Belgique francophone, c'est que le déploiement du réseau va se faire par la RTBF. Donc la RTBF est euh, la radio publique belge francophone. Euh, à partir de, du, du printemps, nous allons déployer un tout nouveau réseau euh, avec la couverture de, de toute la communauté française, ce qu'on appelle la Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles en Belgique. Mais la particularité, c'est que sur ce réseau, nous allons diffuser les propres radios de la RTBF et les nouvelles radios à venir, mais aussi euh, les, ras, les, les radios privées en réseau. Et donc sur un seul et même réseau, sur les mêmes multiplexes, on trouvera à la fois les radios euh, publiques et les radios privées. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a une collaboration, une coopération en fait parfaite entre services publics, radio commerciales d'envergure nationale ou multiville oui. et les radios locales. Au niveau de la distribution, donc nous serons sur le, sur le même réseau, les mêmes multiplexes avec la, la même qualité. Euh, ça, c'est important à souligner. Après ça, euh, on ne s'arrête pas seulement à la distribution. Il y a aussi la promotion. Ensemble, nous sommes dans une société coopérative qui s'appelle maradio.be et qui a justement pour vocation euh, de s'attaquer à la promotion euh, du DAP+, de manière conjointe. C'est-à-dire que vous mutualisez à la fois les opérations de communication, de sensibilisation auprès du public, mais également toutes les, euh, j'allais dire, actions collectives qui peuvent être portées en fait euh, conjointement. Exactement. Et on a commencé cette année. On parlait de, du secteur automobile qui est très important. Nous, en 2017, on axera notre communication sur le secteur automobile et la distribution, le retail. Euh, on a fait une première opération conjointe, d'ailleurs en partenariat avec la Flandre, 
au Salon de l'Auto de Bruxelles euh, maintenant, en, en, début, début janvier. Et donc, c'est vraiment la première fois qu'ensemble radio privée, radio publique au niveau belge francophone et en collaboration avec la FLAN, nous avons euh, parlé du DAB+, au secteur automobile et au public qui participait. Alors, il euh... y a un petit point qu'il faut préciser pour, pour nos amis qui, qui, qui écoutent ce, cet échange, c'est que la RTBF représente le service public francophone. Exactement. Hein, le, le service public néerlandophone, donc flamand, c'est la VRT. Oui. Comment ça se passe justement au sein du même pays avec deux régulateurs, deux services publics totalement autonomes et distincts l'un de l'autre Est-ce qu'il y a une, une des opérations, j'allais dire, conjointes aussi pertinentes et, et, et ambitieuses et pragmatiques du côté euh, euh, que, que, tel que vous les faites en Wallonie qu'entre justement les acteurs de la Flandre qui se sont aujourd'hui déjà quelque part positionnés. Il y a déjà un multiplex avec 10 radios euh, qui euh, sont radio diffusées privée, oui. absolument oui. sur quasiment euh, enfin, sur une part très significative en tous les cas du, du territoire euh, flamand. Comment ça se passe entre la Flandre et la, et la Wallonie-Bruxelles C'est tout le challenge parce qu'il n'y a pas forcément à la base un agenda commun. Euh, ce sont des stratégies euh, différentes. Mais vu la taille du pays et vu euh, l'importance, on a Bruxelles au milieu qui, qui est bilingue. Euh, C'est important de se coordonner sur, sur la promotion, justement. Et donc, on est sur les, les mêmes agendas. Euh, nous, notre déploiement débarre maintenant au printemps avec un, un réseau qui sera totalement opérationnel euh, au premier trimestre 2018. Euh, la Flandre a annoncé euh, que le, les radios euh, publiques et privées en réseau euh, seraient 100 pour, enfin, en DAB euh, pour l'été 2018 ou avant. Donc euh, de ce point de vue-là, on est sur le, le, le même agenda au niveau de la disponibilité en DAB+. Et puis la promotion suit euh, sur base de cet agenda et on va tâcher de caler euh, nos, nos promotions euh, euh, Nord-Sud. Et quelque part sur le même constat, encore plus j'allais dire à Bruxelles qui est une, un, un, un îlot bilingue au milieu de la Flandre, ce qui n'est pas sans complexifier le, le paysage radiophonique, justement pour permettre de pallier toute cette saturation et cet encombrement du spectre Tout à fait, oui. dont souffre la FM, en particulier en, 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 en Belgique. En Belgique francophone, on va tenter francophone de, de doubler l'offre radiophonique. Avec combien de programmes, justement tout dépend de, de ce qui va être accordé par le CSA, mais techniquement, on a la capacité d'avoir 24 programmes pour démarrer de multiplex. Et vous, vous avez le, la, la même approche que Despeignais décrivait tout à l'heure Jacqueline, c'est-à-dire un, un engagement fort avec les constructeurs automobiles c'est l'objectif. La plupart d'entre eux ont une politique euh, belgique Netherland, Béné, le, le Béné du Benelux. Et donc, étant donné que la, les Pays-Bas sont, sont en, en avance par rapport à nous sur le déploiement des AB+, euh, bah les, 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 les véhicules qui sont déjà équipés en, aux Pays-Bas sont maintenant euh, équipés en standard en Belgique. Je pense à des marques comme Renault, qui, à chaque renouvellement de gamme, euh, installe en standard le DAB+. Même chose pour Peugeot. De plus en plus de véhicules VW. Maintenant, les nouvelles Golf, les nouvelles Polo sont, sont équipées. Et euh, c'est une très, bo très bonne chose. Merci beaucoup, Nicolas. Okay. Et, et maintenant, on va donc parler de, du marché allemand, un marché qui s'est se, beaucoup développé. Euh, nous allons donc euh, présenter Carsten Zerger. Bonjour. Bo Good afternoon. Um, thank you. Take this one. Thank you. Okay. It's great being here. Um, Carsten, um, could you describe us the situation in Germany? Um, DAB is a very successful standard in Germany. You have national wide multiplexes, local multiplexes. Um, last year, about one million devices were sold in Germany. Uh, it's always, we, are, we French people are very impressed because when, when you go to a Saturn, which is like Darty in France or KDV in Berlin, like Printemps, you have amazing corners with uh, great devices, usually with a, a huge choice and wide uh, choice of, uh, of devices. How do you explain this success of implementation of the DAB Plus in Germany? Coming from Saturn and the, all the little DAB radios in the, in the, in the places we can buy them, um, we actually have people walking and talking to vendors in the shop, explaining to them the, the, the benefits of DAB. We have four people, they are already working for four years now. They have visited, I don't know, 30,000 different Saturn Media Markt, 
uh, places and teach uh, the vendors there because personnel changes every six months. So they come back in six months and teach them again. So that's a bottom-up strategy. But coming from top down, the main reason why we love DAB is uh, because it's cheap. It's actually the Germans saving money. You know, the FM uh, transmitters, they cost so much energy. Um, DAB is more cost efficient. And as the German public service is being paid by the public, um, it's 1750 a month that you have to pay for receiving public radio service. Um, everybody's trying to cut costs. And the new network is much cheaper. And of course, there's more variety. For example, in Bavaria, Munich, you have now 44 regional stations. There are 13 national wide, and we can count up uh, between uh, Turingia and Bavaria, we have up to 66 different stations being received. So that's a whole no lot new of variety. And the latest station, the Bavarians, they love Umta music you know, with Lederhosen and all that. They started a station doing just that, just a year ago. And this one station has sold two radios with a blue button saying, you know, Schlager and Heimat, Heimat, the German word for, you know, home. Home. Yeah. Uh, they sold 70,000 radios because it's a digital only program for the people listening to Umta music. Well, so that's about target groups. And that's pretty interesting because the landscape, the radio landscape was very particular in Germany. You do not have two regulators uh, like in, in Belgium, whereas 16, yes. because every land, every uh, region federal has got its own regulator. So that means every FM station was regional. You didn't really have national wide stations. And I think like, as we just said a couple of minutes ago, DAB was an opportunity to handle with this situation and have it better because the FM was, didn't allow that national wide development uh, due to historical matters like every land had its own regulator. Exactly. Just as Jacqueline said, FM is full. And uh, I'm working for Deutschland Radio, which is the Deutschland Funk, the, like, like, uh, uh, um, uh, the French public radio service. And we only had 60% of coverage with FM. Obviously, we are pro-DAB because then we can have almost 100%. Currently, the German network is 95% of all the area of Germany, 98% of the roadways, Autobahn, you know, the Germans love it, uh, are being covered with DAB. And now we're targeting, of course, the, the car manufacturers. So for national services, this is the best thing to have because you can drive on, drive on. You never fiddle with the dial. It always works. And there's a big piece of news coming on the 24th of February. The um, application um, ends for the second national multiplex. We're getting another one. Second national multiplex. Um, in the summer, we'll know who has applied and it might be going on air in the end of this year. 15 new stations nationwide coming. So a new multiplex, new national wide station, and also a point, the, the landscape in Germany now has a um, station that used to be local or regional that, that now became national, like, for instance, Energy Munich that became the national one, or uh, Deutschland um, uh, Sunshine Live, for yes. instance, and several other stations. All right. And now you're developing and increasing the thematic formats, right? Exactly. Um, it's all about taste and quality and, of course, uh, target groups. So we are wondering who is coming, but currently now on the first national multiplex, you have a church radio station, you have of course the informative, uh, like, like Deutschlandfunk uh, in, in info uh, service, you have techno music, you have uh, not Umta music, but let's say country and western music, and uh, in some areas even regional uh, uh, um, um, varieties of that. So it's all about variety. We don't know yet who has applied. It's on the 24th of February, we know. But there might be coming big players, for example, the Bauer Group, that has a lot of money, has, is being very successful in Britain and other countries, also Norway. And they, they are from Germany. They've never had any FM license because they applied and they didn't get one. They applied, they didn't get one. They applied, they get a little one, a very small one in Hamburg. But now they want to rewrite the landscape, perhaps, of radio broadcasting. 
And that would be interesting as well, that new companies are coming, doing radio, and the older ones, we all know, might be left behind because they don't look towards DOEAB. So we are kind of enthusiastic telling the older broadcasters, not the one with the gray hair, but you know, have been, been around for a while, to look towards DOEAB and be a part of it. And by the way, Bauer is one of the biggest operator in the UK. I mean, it's not yeah. a challenger. They have a huge station in the UK. They were looking to make money with VFM, and now they are making money with DAB+. And uh, so the, the market is re really healthy, I would say, increasing itself, selling devices. Um, how is it like with the, um, with the institutions, I mean, with the political... Uh, Deutsche Regierung, yeah. uh, how is it like? Do you, did you have a strong commitment? A lot of people were uh, admiring the commitment, for instance, of the uh, um, uh, government from Bayern that helped yeah. a lot the stations to broadcast since the beginning. So is, according to you, the, the commitment of the German uh, government um, uh, important and did it play a role in the success of uh, DAB Plus in Germany? To tell you the truth, sometimes I would love to be in Paris and be a Frenchman. Sometimes I would love to be a Norwegian or even a Swiss because they have a centralized system. We don't. We have little quarrels going on between the lender, the federal states, the, the 16 people saying, no, I don't want this, I want this. But in the end now, we are ready to go with a digital roadmap. Um, they wanted to have it before Christmas, they didn't get it, but we are looking forward to having it this March, and there should be some presentations coming in, in March. So it'll be a roadway towards uh, the digitalization of uh, radio, and especially looking towards the enemies of DAB as you do it. You know, you write something which is very friendly towards the enemy, so he can or she can be a part of it. And this uh, commitment from the, uh, the, the commitment of the German government now consists in obliging all the, the manufacturers to implement DAB in all devices, right? We're I read this project in the German press, by the well, way. That's true. Yeah. We tried it. We even went to the EU and, and also with, uh, since the EU, sometimes a bit slower than the regional governments, sometimes. Uh, we had tried to be it, <laughs> do it on the national level, which is our Telekommunikationsgesetz, which is a big you know, law. And we have to f find three more lines into that, put th three more lines into that law, uh, telling that beginning 2019, we would love to have every radio that has some kind of, not just a dial, but some, some kind of display. Everyone that has a display should have a digital chip inside. That's our pledge. It's not run through. We have to still fighting, but that's our pledge. Difficult. It's very difficult for um, um, a French speaker to talk about the German market without considering the car industry. Yeah. Because Mercedes, BMW, oh no, I'm sorry, Mercedes, BMW, um, Opel, Volkswagen, Audi, Smart are all German brands, groups, and so on. Did you have a special um, um, commitment, relationship? with all those car manufacturers to implement DAB in all the cars because Germany is a huge market for the audience, radio audiences and listening in the cars. People do long way trips, long road trips in the cars. Uh, it's culture in Germany. It's, uh, so how was this relationship? I should begin the answer with a joke. Would you believe that in Germany, a radio is not part of a car you buy. The Germans try to pay for everything. And I asked car manufacturers, how come that you still sell cars without any radio? Well, we can make money out of it. That was the answer. The Germans are able and willing to pay 50, 100, 100, 200, 400 euros for a radio. So to begin with, it's not standard fit. But now answering your question, we have to build up the pressure. Tomorrow, on the 1st of February, um, uh, my boss, Mr. Stoll, who is the boss of Deutschland Radio, is talking with the boss of ARD and Mr. Wismann, who is the boss of the Car Manufacturers Association in Berlin, to give it a special push, to make it a standard fit. Option, it's always there. And there, for example, the Volkswagen Group is very interesting, where you can make a lot of money with the Beetle or Golf, uh, um, um, by the way. Um, Skoda, which is a, a, a daughter company of Volkswagen, has DAB included in many cars. So 
even it's the same company, they have a different strategy. And now we're talking to the ones that do include DAB to push the market and put them into the light. Thank you, Karsten. Just to conclude, um, of course, my uh, conclusion would be around the model of Norway, which is doing the digital switchover, the famous DSO. How do you consider this policy in Germany now that DAB Plus is successful? Success is good, but the adoption rate towards 50 or 60 or 70 percent, like in the uh, Netherlands, um, has still to grow. Uh, we have now 21.4 uh, cars uh, percent of the cars uh, line fit with uh, DAB radios. We, we reach 9.5 million people with DAB already. Um, so DSO is not a topic yet. It's all about hybrid. But we can talk about that a few years later if you want to. Carsten, vielen Dank. Merci beaucoup. Bitte schön. Um, eh bien voilà, les débats sont désormais clos. Merci en tous les cas d'y avoir assisté. Vous avez maintenant un peu une, une vision à la fois de euh, nos différents voisins qui représentaient respectivement les Pays-Bas, la Belgique francophone, l'Allemagne, mais également les intentions du euh, euh, membre du collège du CSA, Nicolas Curien, concernant le DAB+, qui, comme vous le voyez, est de plus en plus considéré à la fois par, nos, euh, par de, les professionnels et par les acteurs comme... Euh, en tous les cas, un moyen euh, de rééquilibrer certaines carences ou saturations de la bande FM. Je pense que c'était en tous les cas très intéressant de les entendre euh, à la fois pour euh, nous parler des spécificités de chacun des pays, parce que finalement, chaque pays est très différent euh, l'un de l'autre. Euh, et en même temps, euh, à chaque fois, le DAB+, apparaît comme une opportunité pour euh, justement pallier les saturations et les carences de la bande FM. Merci à vous. The European Radio Show.